Wow. Thanks. Uh, you've seen uh, already uh, enough of me, I think. I'm just going to do one presentation, and I'm not going to be on stage tomorrow. So, uh, I, it's, uh, how do you guys feel? How, how is the day so far? It's good? Cool. Very cool. So, I have the closing presentation of the first day. Uh, after this, uh, we have a closing of the day. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy, super excited to be here and, uh, and finally be able to, to give this presentation. Um, so it's going to be a, a, about the Things Network stack version 3. And as I uh, already mentioned this morning, uh, we are finally going to launch it. So um, just a very brief history of what we've been doing. Um, version 0. So what is version V3 is obviously version 3. But we also had a V0 that was our initial prototype. And I uh, programmed that uh, myself together with uh, Luke, who is uh, a, a guy I uh, knew from uh, a, a remote working trip in Barcelona in the very first weeks of uh, the Things Network. And while Winke was in the Netherlands uh, creating a community and gathering people and calling companies and organizing meetups, I was um, uh, programming and I was implementing the first, uh, yeah, the first version of the LoRaWAN uh, stack. And it was super simple. It was just, you know, you could connect a gateway to it. It was a hosted version. And um, uh, we only supported ABP. There was no device registry. It was super simple. Uh, and it was just to validate the experiment. The experiment was, do, do people actually buy a gateway? And will they uh, connect it also to, to our hosted server? And also, uh, will they keep the gateway online? And will they actually start using it and start developing it? And that worked. Uh, and that worked really well. And that was actually, that was actually the very first conference uh, that we did. So last year was our first official Things conference. But in August uh, 2015, uh, we had the, the first uh, conference where Wink and I presented the idea for the first time uh, to the world. And can, can I show hands who was there? In, yeah, it's a, so these are really people from, from the very early beginning. That's, that's really cool to, to have them here. So it's a very small group, but that's, uh, it, it was very small at the time. V1 was our first uh, real version, um, and that was more to validate uh, LoRaWAN as a protocol. So we implemented LoRaWAN there. We had uh, a device registry. We had OTAA. Um, we had some really basic uh, Mac layer implementation. And then we figured out that we, um, we didn't put the, the, the separation of concerns right in the, in the design. So we had a few things that were in the wrong place. And uh, we rushed it a little bit because we had to do something. Um, so quite soon, we already started on V2. And that is what we have today. So we run V2 on the public community network uh, and also on private networks. Um, we've been working for 18 months on V3. Uh, so we started this in July 2017 with the first meetings. And the initial reason to, to work on V3 was actually to, um, because we, we couldn't deploy V2 in an easy way. Uh, if we wanted to deploy V2 with, with everything, all the integrations, uh, all the components, it would take around uh, 15 to 20 Docker containers, which is really hard to manage and to set up and to configure and, and everything. Um, so it wasn't really portable. For running a public network is quite easy because you have a few, a handful of clusters, uh, and you can. It, it's worth the effort for a lot of uh, users, a lot of gateways to do that. But if you want to set up a private network with V2, that's just too much work. So that was one reason. Another reason to start with V3 was. Uh, to support LoRaWAN uh, 1.1. And um, in July 2017, I think that was a few months before the technical committee uh, ratified uh, the 1.1 certification, um, we thought, you know, we have to have an implementation because there will be devices out there with uh, LoRaWAN 1.1 uh, support. Uh, I, I don't think there's any off-the-shelf device available today with 1.1 support, let alone that there are certifications. So that actually, it, it, it took much longer. It's a really good specification, but um, it's still quite early for, for that. So um, when we started this design, we started to implementing it, and we, we, had, you know, we had some ideas, a lot of lessons learned from V2, but also throughout the way, we figured out that we really wanted to do it really right and to invest a lot of time 
in a really good product. So that's what we did. And uh, we took 18 months to do that. We started from scratch, so it's not, it's, this is not an update of V2, technically. We started really with an empty repository, uh, everything from, from scratch. And we did some, uh, we took uh, some bits and pieces from V2, but that's really, I would say, is less than 1% of the code base uh, is actually taken from V2. So it's really uh, designed from, uh, from the ground up and built from the ground up. So if you look at the code bases, so I did some, some uh, lines of code counting, and it's, it's, as a software developer, engineer, architect, it's really, uh, these numbers don't say a lot, but this is actually uh, comparable because we use the same language, uh, Go, uh, for V0, V1, V2, V3. Uh, and uh, v, V0 just had uh, not even 1,000 lines of code. It was really simple, built in a few weeks. Um, V1 and V2 um, were already quite big. And V3, like I said, it's completely rewrite. And um, I think we had about 85,000 lines of code in, in Go. And that's just without any comments, without uh, uh, with no text files, no generated codes, no dependencies. It's just all the lines of code that we actually wrote ourselves. Uh, and as you can also see, uh, the front end is, uh, is a smaller portion. And that's because the console of V3 is not ready yet. So we have a very nice groundwork. We have uh, a few screens ready, uh, but it's not the way the console is not featured enough yet to operate the network. So this, the V3 bar will actually be growing uh, because, uh, obviously, because of the front end, but also because this is really our ongoing uh, project that we will be working on um, uh, as we have been doing. Um, so we have 50% more uh, backend code than in V2 already. And this is an investment of 102 person months. So if you, uh, and, and this is 18 months uh, with in total about 11 people uh, that have been contributing, uh, all as a dedicated team in a private repository on GitHub, um, hidden from the public. Uh, we had some really lengthy discussions about uh, a lot of topics. Uh, but it, it's, a, yeah, it's a huge investment. And um, uh, I think as a startup, it's uh, it's pretty uh, yeah it's pretty uh, it's, it's not very normal I think or uh, it's pretty exciting actually to be able to uh, to run this technical project uh, with this uh, amount of resources uh, without actually uh, making any money here because this is just full time development uh, and and also as you probably know we don't have any investors or VCs or things like that so. Um, that's, that's a little bit of our, our investment. It's a massive investment for us. And also, we uh, took a lot of experience from, so it's not only the 102 person months, but actually, from the beginning, we already know, knew what we were doing, because we have a lot of experience with uh, operating V2 and a lot of experience with LoRaWAN. So it's not that we spent the first months on figuring out what LoRaWAN is, but really, we started from, with a very clear idea of what we wanted to build. So there's also a lot of lessons learned, a lot of things that we uh, thought that um, we wanted to have, and we never brought it to V2 because we thought, you know, we're going to bring this to V3 only. It's a lot of work. Uh, but we, uh, we built a big foundation, and we uh, created a platform for ourselves and for the developer community to put all the features in there that we want to have. So why did we do this? Uh, we wanted to do it right. So uh, we didn't want to compromise on quality. And the groundwork needs to be fu future-proof. And in V2, we kind of had our own ideas of how to implement a, a server stack. And actually, um, it, it, was, it was kind of normal, I think, at the time when we did that, because we only had the LoRaWAN specification as a, as a PDF. And uh, Throughout the time that V2 was there, the technical committee and the Laura Alliance worked on uh, very helpful documents also to, uh, that, that kind of standardized the way uh, a service stack should be. And that's uh, driven by, uh, primarily by the LoRaWAN backend interfaces, which is a document that has been published also uh, somewhere one and a half year ago, uh, which also served as really good input for our stack. And the backend interfaces um, 
uh, specify, it's not, it's, it specify the interfaces between components in a LoRaWAN network. And we thought, OK, we, we, we have some uh, ideas uh, to do this ourselves. Uh, but we actually thought, OK, let's just be as standard as possible. Let's just take LoRaWAN literal. Let's take the backend interfaces literal. Let's really design our APIs around that. Uh, even though we sometimes have uh, uh, better ideas or we have a different use case. But we thought, OK, let's, let's really be standards compliant. Another thing that makes this really hard and complicated is that V3 is really designed for n in different aspects. And designed for n means that uh, you design for, for any number. Uh, so if you have, if you set up, if you design a piece of software, for example, for, uh, that's going to be run on one server with one process, uh, that's, that's pretty easy. And, and also, I think in V2, we did that uh, a couple of times. But with V3, um, we um, support any number of LoRaWAN version, any number of uh, regional parameters version side by side. So you can have a device registry with a whole mix of uh, versions, and you can set all these settings on a per device uh, level. Um, we also, um, uh, and comparing this to V2, for example, we actually have a fixed uh, LoRaWAN version. It's 102, and we have a fixed uh, regional parameters version, which is 102 RFB. Um, second, um, we really build this to scale and for replication. So the clusters which uh, run a V3 cluster, which is uh, composed of a number of components in V3, um, allow for a replication within the cluster. So you can actually run multiple network servers, multiple application servers side by side. And uh, they will be able to, uh, you can have a load balancer in front of that, and they will be able to take uh, to split the, the load in, in a network. So that is within a cluster. We can replicate within a cluster, but we can also scale clusters easily. With V2, we can also do that. So we have a global network today. But the way it works is that uh, components in one uh, uh, cluster are directly uh, connected to another component in another cluster. And that works if you have six, seven clusters. But with V3, uh, we want to have way more public clusters, so we want to go times two, times three uh, in the coming months. But also, we want to connect these private networks, as I uh, explained this morning, through the packet broker. So our solution here is a packet broker. So we don't have direct inter-cluster communication, but we uh, work with a packet broker uh, for offloading uh, traffic and to subscribe to the traffic that's for that cluster. Um, and finally, um, we have a lot of uh, demand uh, from, from, from users on the public community network that wanted to have a more control over their infrastructure. They wanted to run the uh, network services themselves. And um, in the beginning of V2, we couldn't really, uh, we couldn't really help uh, those uh, users because we didn't have a good, solid uh, private network stack for them to work with. This could be customers. This could be uh, uh, customers that were actually willing to pay, uh, but it could also be uh, developers that just wanted to get started with an open source distribution. It is just way too hard to set up V2 uh, in an open source way. So um, we, we wanted v V3 to, to support different deployment models with the same code base. And that's actually what I presented last year, um, that we support all these deployment models and that we really designed it for uh, for these deployment models. So where V2, which is the, the lighter shade of blue um, uh, in, uh, in the middle, not the lightest, but the lighter, uh, is, is really designed for public networks. Like I said, we, we can operate those uh, 15 to 20 Docker containers easily, uh, but you don't do that for small private networks. Uh, and V3 is really aiming to support all of these deployments. So this is what we built. Uh, this follows the uh, LoRaWAN network reference model. Network reference model uh, defines the role of a joint server, defines the role of a network server and the application server. We added a few components here that doesn't break anything. It's just um, we think it's better to, to have a few extra components here. So we have a, a gateway server, and gateways are connected to a gateway server directly. And we support different protocols there. So we support the legacy UDP protocol. We have MQTT to communicate with the Things Gateway. 
Uh, but we also support Basic Station, uh, the protocol that has been open sourced today by Semtech, uh, that is also um, uh, used by the Things Industrial Gateway and the Things Indoor Gateway. The network server is obviously that's the heart of the of the network. It's doing all the LoRaWAN Mac layer stuff. Application server um, is already uh, working in your application domain. It has access to your application session key. It can encrypt payload. It can decrypt payload. Um, a joint server has access to your root keys. And the identity server uh, in our model uh, is a registry of users, applications, gateways, uh, and also the collaborators and the access rights and things like that. Uh, and we have monitoring. So all these components publish events, also as I will explain a little bit later. Uh, and you will be able to, to really monitor what's going on in your, in your cluster. On the right, you see the integrations. So we don't, today, we don't have the public cloud integrations ready yet. But we do have MQTT and HTTP. Uh, those are the most popular integrations. Um, and th this is, if you, if you deploy this, this is a cluster. This is one cluster that's fully self-contained. Uh, you can deploy this on a VM, and uh, you, can, uh, you can start running a private network. But you can also, because all these components are, uh, are separate um, uh, binaries, in fact, uh, you can also uh, dedicate a VM to be the gateway server, dedicate a VM to be a network server or an application server. And that way, you can already uh, start scaling the network and, and have more uh, power available uh, to run a private network. You can also have an external application server. So you can run uh, a gateway server and a network server in one domain and have an application server somewhere else uh, that runs maybe in a different security domain and that works with, uh, uh, with an external network server. And this is also what we are going to do in the public network. Uh, so we operate in the Things Network, public network, uh, all of these components uh, in different regions. But you can decide to take, uh, to go to GitHub or go to our, uh, get our Docker image, uh, start up a Docker container for the application server, and uh, connect directly with uh, um, a network server that's run in a public cluster. And that allows you to really mix and match all these components. You can run a, a private application server. You can use a public application server. You can do whatever you want. So what, what are really the key benefits? What, why, why should you upgrade? Um, well, there are, there are a lot of reasons. V2 is not so bad, though. But we have, we have a really some key benefits uh, that we don't have in, in V2. So first, uh, it's support for different LoRaWAN versions. And, and this is uh, really being future-proof. So we have all the old version support of LoRaWAN, so 1.0, 1.0.1, 1.0.2, 1.0.3. Um, also 1.1, and all the regional parameters. So we have uh, the band support, and we have, uh, as I will show a little bit later, also a lot of frequency plans. We have support for class A, B, and C. Um, uh, class B is currently not available yet, but this is something that we'll be adding uh, quite soon. Um, we don't see a lot of demand for class B at the moment, but class C is actually one of the most wanted features in V2. And actually, one thing here is that Supporting class C is not difficult, right? The only thing you need to do from a network server is to tell a gateway to send a message. But to do that in a distributed way and to do that also in a secure way and also to account for scheduling conflicts as well as uh, maintaining and, and checking the duty cycle of a gateway, that becomes um, a little bit harder. Uh, but we have that, of course, natively in uh, V3. We also uh, support the backend interfaces, and that means that um, we can offer a secure join procedure uh, through, uh, through those backend interfaces. So you can have an external join server, uh, and you can have, for example, a, a local network server, an application server, uh, that, uh, that do the device activation through that external uh, join server. And this works in two ways. So you can have, you can have a V3 instance that uh, uses an external joint server to activate your devices. So if, uh, if you use, for example, the modem of uh, Semtech that Nicholas presented this morning, Semtech operates a joint server. Since we implement these uh, backend interfaces, our V3 components can activate your devices through the backend interfaces with their joint server. But it also works the other way around. 
uh, maybe you have reasons to use another network stack, not v3, uh, for the application server and the network server. Maybe um, uh, you're, uh, you, yeah, and, and, but maybe you want to uh, have your own joint server and want to control that, install that in your own infrastructure. You can just take the v3 joint server component. It supports the uh, backend interfaces, and you can have other networks using that joint server for device activation. We have really fine-grained uh, settings for, on the Mac and uh, file level, so the physical layer, uh, for each individual end device. So you can tune uh, all kinds of parameters, like the RX1 delay, uh, RX2 settings. Um, and that means also that if you have, for example, gateways that have a slow backhaul, like 3G or even satellite, you can change the RX1 delay of the devices that are seen by that gateway from one second to five seconds, for example, uh, so that you can make that round trip uh, for, for class A uh, downlink. Also, we have an open source device repository uh, that is going to be maintained by the device manufacturers. So when a, a new device, off-the-shelf device, like you see on the LoRaWAN wall, hits the market, um, we're going to make it really easy for those manufacturers to um, to add their device to that repository. So this is an open source repository on GitHub where they, they enter the name, the, their, their name as their manufacturer, the model, maybe a firmware version, uh, a, a picture, but also the payload formatters. So they can say they can have the functions to decode payload, to encode payloads. And that means that in the console, users can just say, OK, I'm going to register 1,000 uh, devices, and this is the model, this is the type, this is the version. And the V3 stack knows how to deal with the data. It knows the default Mac settings. It knows the file settings. It knows how to deal with the payload. We also have configurable frequency plans. And this is also an open source repository. So we have the Things Network, LoRaWAN frequency plans, um, where we have a bunch of YAML files. And um, uh, we made all these frequency plans already, so you don't have to do anything here. But if you want to do that, this is our uh, list of frequency plans. Uh, we are also open for uh, pull requests. Uh, if you have some ideas for uh, deploying LoRaWAN in a country that's not listed here. And if you then look at the European frequency plan, you see exactly here all the frequencies that we're using for uplink, uh, for downlink, uh, and some um, uh, radio, uh, radio settings uh, to configure the gateway. So that's really transparent, really open. And this is hosted on GitHub, but you can also, if you run everything locally, you can also uh, clone this or download this folder um, put it locally on the server, and then the V3 stack doesn't need, to, doesn't need to have an internet connection to actually load these frequency plans. What's also one of the most wanted features is, is tracing. So what happens uh, exactly on the message level? So we added correlation IDs. And this maybe uh, looks a little bit um, complicated, but it's actually quite simple. This is uh, a... Uh, an, um, confirmed, uh, this is an acknowledgment of a confirmed downlink message. That means that your application sent a downlink message, a confirmed downlink message to the end device, and the end device confirms that back to the application. That's what you see here. So you see, this, is, this comes from the MQTT uh, uh, broker, um, but uh, you can also get these messages over HTTP. You can configure a specific endpoint for downlink ACK, uh, also for downlink send, downlink failed, downlink queued, downlink knock. Um, also when there's a location resolved, it's not only uplink messages or join accept uh, events that you can get. So this is an acknowledged downlink. So you see in the top, you see the device identifiers, uh, the def UI, the join UI, device address. And there you have the correlation IDs. And those correlation IDs can be used to correlate how events are related to each other. So you see in the downlink arc in the bottom, you see the message that was actually acknowledged. So you see that is the message that you sent. You sent uh, a few bytes confirmed. Um, and you see there also the AS uh, colon in the bottom, the two lines, is application server put those correlation IDs there. And when they go all the way back to the network server, to the gateway server, the device sends an uplink message, uh, you see those um, uh, uh, correlation IDs uh, uh, with that uplink message. And that gives you really good insight in, uh, in, in how things uh, are, are handled, which gateway is connected, what the correlation ID is of that connection, uh, and, and, and things like that. Another really important feature, and, and one of the, I think, yeah, uh, more advanced things is that we have uh, downlink scheduling and prioritization. 
So we don't use immediate scheduling. If we send class C, we don't say to the gateway, just send it whatever, uh, whatever conflicts or whatever. Uh, we, but we schedule everything in the gateway server uh, in real time. And we use a priority for that. So in EU, for example, you have um, uh, duty cycle uh, uh, limitations. And that means that um, uh, you, can, you have a, a limited amount of downlink capacity per time unit, per hour, for example. And in order to deal with that, and also in, in a distributed way, uh, and also if you share a network with, with other applications, you can budget the downlink capacity to certain applications or even to certain messages. So for example, you can say if, if for example, you use schedule priority normal, that means that you can, uh, you can use up to 70% of the available uh, utilization for duty cycle. Um, but above normal uh, can go up to 80%. And high and, and highest can go up to uh, 100 percent, and it means that, for example, you can you can have a lower schedule priority for uh, for firmware updates, uh, and that means that only those messages actually get transmitted if if there is enough capacity, but you can have a higher priority for join accepts, for example. So that's also built in uh, in V3. So what's next? Um, we have a firmware update server uh, that we're going to launch. It's going to be part of the a TTI distribution. Um, we probably uh, will have uh, the, the building blocks for doing firmware updates in the open source distribution. So that means multicast, um, the fragmentation stuff, uh, and the time synchronization. But the update server itself is going to be proprietary. Uh, we have monitoring and alerting. It's going to be a bit more advanced. Uh, there's going to be a hosted solution uh, for which we also provide an SLA. Uh, we are building some advanced cloud integrations, and we do global pairing through the packet broker. So this is proprietary, and that means that everything else, what I just showed, that whole architecture picture, everything is open source. You can take the whole repository, compile everything from source, run a whole full-powered private network yourself. And all these services are built on top of that. So that's also what we do. We build on top of the open source distribution. And we also invite developers to do the same. They can contribute to the same open source distribution, but also with the permissive Apache 2 license. We also enable everyone to build proprietary additions to the stack if they want, if they see a value add there. So this is the moment we've all been waiting for, making it open source. So I have uh, Roman there. I, I don't have a laptop here. So we've been working on this um, in, uh, in a private repository. And I think if Roman can. Uh, yeah, so we have here our private repository, Things Network, LoRaWAN stack. So we have a new repository. Uh, we have more than 4,000 commits, 11 contributors. Uh, and if you see here in the graph, we put a lot of effort in the last, in the last weeks um, to, to get it finished uh, for the show. Um, so we can go to the settings and to actually make this repository now public. Uh, so we're going to do that live. Uh, here in the danger zone, make this repository public. <laughs> and uh, we're going to type the name of the repository. There's my password filled in already. It's very secure. Yes. And there we are. That is 102 months of person, 102 person months of effort here, give it away to you guys, to the community, uh, to, to build awesome networks and to, to get started. Speaking of getting started, um, we have a, we build a, a guide, a getting started guide uh, to, um, uh, to get started yourself. Um, you can go to uh, this URL, if you can, you can take a picture or whatever. You can also find it in the repository, so GitHub, the Things Network, and then LoRaWAN stack. Um, there are links as well there. Uh, and this guide walks you through getting started, setting up a server with V3. As I said, we don't have the console ready, so this is all CLI, the command line interface, but we also have the steps there, all the things you need to do uh, to get started. You can have an end-to-end -end, uh, solution. Uh, in, uh, in 10, 15, 20 minutes, 
uh, depending on uh, your experience with, uh, with uh, Docker and the like. So um, yeah, very happy to finally have, uh, have launched this. This is an ongoing project. We have, we have uh, a lot of things that we want to work on. And like I said, we, we have a few things to, um, like the console, we want to finish that. But this is all going to be out there now in the open. Uh, and you will also be part of our development. So um, with that, uh, I want to thank you for, um, for, uh, for listening. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, seeing uh, V3 clusters deployed everywhere. Thanks.